-hmm. Welcome back to the Algebraic Raptor and Quantum Information Workshop. This morning we have a talk by Hajime Tanaka about spatial search on Johnson graphs by continuous time quantum walk. So, uh, I'm sorry, so now the uh, speaker and the microphone are not, not so good. So I will return to the original setting. Uh, so today, uh, first off, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for, for the invitation to talk, give a talk here. So now uh, in Japan, it is 10 o'clock in the evening. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot attend the uh, even uh, morning, uh, I'm sorry, afternoon session. So, but still, it is a great pleasure to be here. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, some results about uh, continuous time uh, quantum work. And this talk is based on uh, joint work uh, with uh, one of my students, uh, Mohamed Sabri, and also Renat Portugal. So he's from Brazil. He's at National Laboratory for uh, Scientific Computing. So by the way, uh, so he, uh, uh, I live in a very small apartment and the walls are very thin, so uh, I, I cannot speak loudly. So th this is why I'm using a very, very strange setting. And anyway, anyway uh, let us start my talk. So first off, I'd like to begin with some a brief introduction about myself. So some of you may know uh, that I am a mathematician and who is studying uh, distance regular graphs and association schemes. And in particular, I'm very interested in the theory of the Terwilliger algebras, so-called Terwilliger algebras. So the Terwilliger algebra is an extension of the JCC algebra. And JCC algebra is um, always commutative, but the Terwilliger algebra is non-commutative. And I'm very interested in uh, the representation theory of the Terwilliger algebra and its application. Uh, this is about myself. And on the other hand, uh, it's Ryo Segawa. So some of, you, some of you may know him, So he's a specialist in, in quantum works. And until several years ago, he was at Tohoku University. And then uh, in 2018, uh, Segawa invited Portugal to Tohoku University, and he stayed at Tohoku University for uh, about two months. And then uh, during his stay, Portugal, Renato gave us a series of lectures on search algorithms based on quantum works. And so at the time, uh, so this is the second edition of his book, uh, Quantum Works and Search Algorithms. And at the time, this book was in preparation. But we were lucky uh, because uh, he gave us a lecture based on this book in preparation. So he used part of the book uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, search algorithms uh, using quantum works. And then Sabri was at the time a student of Segawa, but unfortunately Segawa moved to a different university. So uh, for some reason, uh, finally he became my PhD student. So then uh, inevitably I became, I, I had to start studying quantum works. Okay, so this is a story. So uh, uh, the lesson from this story is that I'm still a total beginner uh, about quantum works. So I, I know everything uh, about the mathematics uh, used in the talk, in, in this talk, but I'm still a beginner about quantum physics and quantum information, etc. So if I say something, uh, wrong or inappropriate, then please let me know after the talk, okay? So now uh, first I'd like to discuss the general setup about the uh, uh, search algorithms. So let G be a finite simple graph. So here V is the vertex set and E is edge set. And the number of vertices is denoted by capital N, okay? So then, uh, we prepare uh, Hilbert space, uh, which we denote by H. So this is spanned by uh, this kind of vectors. So for each of the vertex V, uh, we uh, prepare uh, a vector bracket V, and we impose that these are uh, mutually orthonormal. 
Okay. And then, uh, so this A is uh, the adjacency matrix of the graph G in the usual sense. So as you know, the VV prime entry of the adjacency matrix is one if and only if uh, these two vertices are adjacent and zero otherwise, okay? The usual sense. And then in the search algorithm, so we fix a marked vertex and the aim of the search algorithm is to find this marked vertex. So at first we do not know which of the vertex it is. So, but the aim is to find this marked vertex. And then following this uh, paper by Childs and Goldstone in 2004, we consider a Hamiltonian of this form. So it is a combination or linear combination of the JCC matrix and this matrix. So this is the orthogonal projection onto the one dimensional eigenspace spanned by bracket W, okay? Is it called a ray call? M maybe. A anyway, so here you see a parameter gamma so this is some certain real scalar, which will be uh, specified later. Hmm? What is the meaning of this one? Yeah, so uh, th this is just a symbol. So for each, uh, uh, each of the vertex V, we pre prepare a vertex uh, vector called bracket V. So this is just a notation. So for each V, we have a vector bracket V and we impose that uh, these are orthonormal. So this is just a notation. Mm -hmm. okay. So th this is the uh, uh, Hamiltonian. And then uh, let us continue the setup. So at first we prepare a certain initial state, which we call uh, bracket psi zero. And then uh, by, by the postulate of quantum physics, so the evolution is governed by this unitary operator. So uh, this initial state, it grows uh, based on, according to this uh, unitary operator. So the state at time t is, uh, is uh, given by this formula. So the, the state at time t is denoted psi t, bracket psi t, and which is given by this formula. And then, uh, again, by the uh, postulate of quantum physics, the, we want to find uh, this marked vertex and uh, the, the probability that we find this marked vertex is given by this one. Yeah. So this is a rule in quantum physics, okay? So here is the problem. Uh, we want to choose an appropriate uh, initial state, uh, bracket the size zero, and we want to choose some uh, scalar gamma and also some time t for which uh, the finding probability is maximum, okay? So this is a goal. And uh, in the classical setting, uh, the finding time is of order uh, the number of vertices n. On the other hand, uh, we want to find uh, t. So uh, we want to have t to be of order square root of n. So this would be a quadratic speed up over the classical algorithm, okay? And here is a remark. So uh, by definition, this adjacency matrix belongs to the adjacency algebra. So this is obvious because by definition, the adjacency algebra is the algebra generated by the adjacency matrix. So of course, the adjacency matrix belongs to the adjacency algebra. And as I mentioned, this adjacent algebra is commutative, okay? On the other hand, uh, as you see here, for, for the Hamiltonian H, we have this term, but this term does not belong to the adjacent algebra in general. So, but uh, still, uh, this uh, recall belongs to the Torilga algebra. So A and this projection both belong to the Torilga algebra, so H belong to, belongs to the Torilga algebra. So then this uh, unitary operator also belongs to the uh, Torilga algebra. And now you see why I became interested in this kind of topic. I love Torilga algebra, and oh, this topic is very closely related to the Torilga algebra. Very interesting for me.
Okay. So here is uh, a list of some previous work. Okay. Uh, and this is a paper I, I mentioned previously in, in the previous slide. So in this paper, uh, they discussed the complete graphs. And in the same paper, they also discussed two other families of graphs and hypercubes and also Cartesian powers of cycles. Oh, but by the way, in, in their papers, they call these graphs uh, lat uh, finite dimensional lattices. But these are Cartesian powers of cycles. And in a more recent paper uh, by these three authors in 2014, they considered strongly regular graphs. Okay? And in a more recent paper, uh, Tom Wong uh, in 2016, uh, he considered the Johnson graphs with diameter three, Johnson graphs. And the last one, uh, these four authors uh, considered Ehrlich Rennie graphs. So these are random graphs. So the last one is a bit of uh, different flavor. But if you look at, uh, look at this list, then you will notice that many of them are just as regular graphs. So the first one, the complete graphs are precisely the just as regular graphs with diameter one, okay? And the hypercubes are, uh, so to speak, the most important family of just as regular graphs. Do you agree? And then, uh, the strongly regular graphs, uh, more precisely, the connected strongly regular graphs are precisely uh, the distance regular graphs with diameter two. And uh, this one, Johnson graphs are also a very important family of distance regular graph. So uh, many of them are distance regular graphs, but uh, when I first looked at uh, this kind of list, I was a bit surprised because uh, nowadays uh, you can find quite a few papers about uh, quantum works. But uh, nevertheless, uh, for example, this Johnson graph, this paper, so Johnson graphs are very important family, but still the paper, this paper appeared just five years ago. This was a bit surprised. So because uh, there are quite a few papers on quantum works. And so uh, it wouldn't be surprised to, to me, if uh, after this seminal paper, uh, many uh, many of the important families of this as regular graphs were uh, discussed right after the publication of this paper, it wouldn't be surprised. But nevertheless, uh, you, you can see strongly regular graphs appeared in 2014, Johnson graphs appeared in 2016. So mm, the situation is not, is very different from what I expected. So, and this is why I became uh, interested in uh, doing something about this in, in this area. I thought that I can do, uh, there are many things I can contribute, okay? So today's topic, so this is our, my, my first outcome of my attempt. So in, in today's talk, uh, we are gonna generalize uh, Tom Wong's result to arbitrary diameter. So this is our goal today. Okay. Ah, by, by the way, uh, so the preprint has appeared in archive. So if you're interested, then please uh, look at this paper. So uh, now let us recall the definition of the Johnson graph. So now let us consider two uh, positive integers, n and k, and k is at least one, and uh, we uh, assume that k is at most n half. So it, it is because uh, by imposing this condition, the Johnson graph has diameter exactly k. So, but anyway, uh, this uh, assumption is not uh, important because in any case, we will let n tend to infinity for fixed k. And the vertex set of the Johnson graph is the set of all k element subsets of this n set. So the number of vertices capital N is uh, N choose K, okay? And the definition of the JCC is that uh, two vertices V and V prime, which are both K element subsets, these are adjacent if and only if they intersect in exactly K minus one uh, elements, 
So this is the definition of the chosen group. And the, the notation is J and K. So by this condition, uh, J and K has diameter K. Oh, but by the way, so let us consider this set VL. So this is a set of uh, vertices of the Johnson graph, uh, which intersect uh, this marked vertex in exactly K minus L vertices. So here L is between zero and K. But, uh, actually, uh, this is a set of vertices in the Johnson graphs at distance L from W. So this L is a distance from W. And now let us consider this kind of uh, picture at the bottom. So here is our uh, marked vertex. Now let us take a vertex V from here. Then uh, let us consider the set of vertices which in this set, which are adjacent to V. And also this is a set of all vertices in VL plus one, which are adjacent to V. But similarly, uh, this is a set of all vertices in this set, which are adjacent to V. Then by elementary uh, calculation, uh, combinatorial counting, you can easily compute uh, the, the number of vertices. So AL, VL, and CL. You can just compute very, in a very elementary way. Then as you can see here, these numbers, as you see here, are all independent of the choice of V and A, W. So I did mention the definition of this as regular graph, but this is actually the definition of this as regular graph. So in a this as regular graph, we always have this kind of picture. And these numbers are independent of the choice of V and W, okay? Oh, but, but here V is taken from V A, V is taken from this set, okay? So now that we have this kind of sets, so we define for each L, we define bracket VL. So we consider the sum. So here the sum is over all vertices V in VL. And uh, we want to have a unit vector. So we divide it by the si square root of the size of VL, okay? And in particular, uh, bracket V naught is equal to the uh, target vector. And then instead of the whole uh, Hilbert space, uh, let us consider the linear span of all of these vectors. So then there are k plus one vectors. So this uh, subspace has dimension k plus one, okay? And then it turns out that uh, actually by the definition of the distance regularity, it follows that this uh, subspace is invariant under the action of the adjacent matrix by the definition of distance regularity. And what's more, uh, be because of this, this subspace is also invariant under this oracle, okay? But then uh, this Hamiltonian is a linear combination of these two matrices. So uh, this subspace is invariant under H and it is also invariant under this unitary operator. So uh, this, uh, invariant, uh, this subspace is invariant under all the uh, matrices in question. So instead of the whole uh, Hilbert space, from now on, we will focus on uh, this subspace. So everything will be done in this subspace, okay? And here is a remark. So this is an invariant subspace, but it, it follows that this is actually an irreducible module for the Twilga algebra. And in the Twilga algebra theory, this subspace is called the primary module for the Twilga algebra. And this is why I became interested in this kind of topic. Oh, let me repeat. Okay, now, uh, now uh, let us, uh, let me discuss the general strategy of the uh, quantum search. So, uh, because the Johnson graph is regular, so any distance regular graph is regular, so it is natural to set the initial state to be this one. This is the uniform superposition. So namely, uh, this is the old ones vector, and it, it is divided by the, 
uh, this one. So, so that this is a unit vector. So this is a scalar multiple of the old ones vector. So then this uh, vector belongs to the invariant subspace. So we choose uh, the initial state like this. And then uh, in this general strategy, oh, so, so uh, I mentioned uh, a list of papers and in many of the papers, uh, they proceed in this way. So uh, what, uh, what we want to do is to find two eigenvalues, row one and row two, and also their eigenvectors, which we denote by X, uh, bracket C1 and bracket C2 of the Hamiltonian, which have the following uh, property. So this initial state, bracket S, is approximately uh, C, uh, bracket C1 minus bracket C2 divided by two. On the other hand, this is the target vertex, uh, target vector. So this is uh, approximately uh, bracket C1 plus bracket C2 divided by two. So we want to find uh, this uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors satisfying uh, these two conditions, okay? And then for, for the running time, we choose uh, smallest possible, smallest uh, positive t such that row one minus row two times t is congruent to pi modulo two pi. And the reason is that, so by the postulate of quantum uh, physics, so the state at time t is given by this one. So this is the initial state, okay? But then uh, here, so now we plug in this formula here, then, uh, so because this C1 is an eigenvector and this C2 is also an eigenvector. So if we apply this uh, unitary operator, then we will get these coefficients, okay? But then now we also plug in this condition here. So first, uh, let us factor out this scalar. Then we will get this one. And the point here is that this, uh, scalar is e to the i pi uh, because of this, okay? So, but as you know, e to the i pi is negative one. So this part is actually uh, bracket C1 plus bracket C2 divided by two. Then by this one, this is approximately equal to this one. So it is a scalar multiple of the target vector. Hmm. So. Then the finding probability is given by this one, but then this psi t, bracket psi t, is a scalar multiple, multiple of the target vector. So the uh, finding probability is uh, approximately equal to one. So in this way, finding probability converges to one. So this is a general strategy of the uh, quantum search algorithm based on uh, continuous time quantum work. So this is a story. So now we apply this general strategy to the Johnson graph, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, we consider the Johnson graphs with fixed diameter. So from now on, we fix the diameter K for the rest of the talk, and we will let N tend to infinity. Okay, then uh, from, from, from the picture, uh, as I showed you before, the matrix expression of the JCC matrix A with respect to this orthonormal basis is given by this kind of uh, tri-diagonal matrix. And here, this matrix T is a diagonal matrix and whose diagonal entries are given by the sizes of the sets V1, V0, V1, VK. But, so this matrix is explicit, but hmm, it's a bit difficult because it is a tri-diagonal matrix. So it's a bit difficult to handle to work with this kind of tri-diagonal matrix. So instead of this, it is much better to work with uh, the di a diagonal matrix. So from now, uh, we will diagonalize this matrix. So uh, in other words, we will find eigenbasis of this matrix. But actually, uh, all the information is already provided in the literature. So in, in the books, 
by such as Banai, Ito, Brower, Cohen, Neumeyer, etc. Everything is known. So it is known that the Johnson graph has the Johnson graph JNK has precisely k plus one distinct eigenvalues. So in decreasing order, these are given by this one, theta L. So theta naught, theta one, theta two, da da da, theta k. So because it is in decreasing order, theta naught is the largest one, and because the Johnson graph is regular, so the theta L is the largest eigenvalue, and which is equal to the valency or degree of the Johnson graph. So now uh, let EL be the orthogonal projection onto the eigenspace in the original Hilbert space with respect to the eigenvalue theta L. Then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this target vector belongs to the environment subspace. But then, and, and also I, I, I mentioned that uh, this subspace is invariant under the action of A, but then, this orthogonal projection is actually a polynomial in A. So uh, this, inf uh, this subspace is also invariant under EL. So as a consequence, this vector also belongs to the subspace. And we, again, we want to have a unit vector, so we divide it by the, uh, the norm. Okay, and we, we denote this vector by uh, bracket bracket theta l. So in this way, uh, so so uh, this is an eigenvector of the adjacent matrix A, and also this subspace has another set of uh, another uh, basis consisting of eigenvectors. So namely, uh, bracket theta l. So in this way, uh, we found an um, also normal basis consisting of eigenvectors of A. Oh, by, by, by the way, the squared norm of this uh, vector is known. So the formula is a bit complicated, but anyway, it, it is known, very explicitly known. Oh, may, maybe I have to hurry. So anyway, so we have a, a uh, orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors. So the matrix representation of the adjacent matrix A is given by this diagonal matrix and the diagonal entries are given by the eigenvalues. This is because these are eigenvectors, okay? And also it's very easy to see that the matrix representing this oracle is uh, given like this. So, but uh, for the rest of the talk, I do not want to say the matrix representing something with respect to, it, it's tedious. So from now on, uh, we will just say, we will identify uh, these mat mat matrix with mat their matrix representation. So I will say that uh, the adjacent matrix A is equal to this diagonal matrix, etc. So this is just to save time, okay? And then, uh, so the Hamiltonian is negative gamma times A minus this oracle, and so this is given by this one. So, but uh, for some technical reason, it is, uh, it, it is more convenient to work with a normalization here. So where uh, the scalar eta is defined by one over gamma n. So this is, it turns out to be more convenient, okay? And all, from now, uh, we also set epsilon to be one over square root of n. And here is uh, our normalization. So then uh, this normalized Hamiltonian uh, is given by this one, okay? But then uh, but by using uh, this one and this one, so you will get this one. But, but anyway, so uh, this uh, normalized uh, Hamiltonian is explicitly written. So this is the point, everything is explicit. So the formula itself uh, very, is very complicated, but anyway, uh, it is explicit. Everything is explicit. And here, uh, from, from here, the reason why I uh, chose this notation symbol is that we will view epsilon as a variable. So when we let n tend to infinity, then this variable epsilon tends to converges to zero, okay? And also we will view 
this data also as a variable. So in this uh, normalized Hamiltonian, uh, as you see here, uh, the, uh, this matrix is written uh, two variable function. So of epsilon and eta, it is a two variable function, okay? So now, uh, as I mentioned, we are interested in finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, normalized Hamiltonian. And eta and epsilon are variables. But what are not just arbitrary eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but as I mentioned, we are interested in uh, eigenvectors that connect in some sense, this initial state and this target vector. And uh, this uh, initial state is actually a uh, scalar multiple of the old ones vector. So it is equal to uh, bracket of theta naught. So, but using our matrix representation, this is the first basis vector. So in the matrix representation, it is just this vector. Okay, one, zero, 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 that doesn't zero. On the other hand, the target vector is by, by some computation, so shown to be equal to this one. And also it is easy to see that this converges to this one, zero, zero, that doesn't zero, and the last entry is one when epsilon is zero. So we, we want to find eigenvectors uh, which connect this vector and this vector. So we want to find such eigenvectors. And here, uh, let us try some specific, specific values. So epsilon is zero and eta is k. Then uh, I, cannot, I, I omit the details, but anyway, this normalized uh, Hamiltonian takes this form. It is a diagonal matrix and the diagonal entries are k, k minus one, da, 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 two, one, and the last entry is k. So then as you see here, the first entry and the last entry are both equal to k. And here, as I mentioned, we want to find eigenvectors connecting this one and this one. Yeah, so uh, this suggests that it is uh, a good idea to focus on uh, the eigenvalue k because we have k's in the first place and the last place. So it is a natural idea, okay? But anyway, uh, we omit the detail, but uh, the result, the technical proposition is this one. So for every A, which is non-zero, then there exist analytic functions, eight epsilon, lambda epsilon, and also CLs. So here, L is from zero to K. So there are several conditions that the eta zero is K. So this choice is uh, give, given by the previous choice. So in the previous choice, we chose eta to be k, okay? So, and also the first function c0 is a constant function e, uh, which is equal to a. And then also uh, this, this part is a normalized uh, Hamiltonian. So, and this times this applied to this vector is lambda epsilon times this vector. So this means that this lambda epsilon is an eigenvalue and this uh, bracket of C is an eigenvector. So here, uh, bracket of C is uh, given in this way. And also another condition is that uh, uh, when we set epsilon to be zero, then uh, this converges to this one. So as you see here, the first entry and the last entries are non-zero and all the other entries are zero, okay? And the, this proposition is very long, so there are Another statement. Oh yeah, so the first entry and the last entry are non-zero. Uh, other entries are zero. So, and the, the next statement is that uh, we can actually uh, describe the eigenvalue lambda, lambda and also the scalar eta. So like this formula. So we can determine these values up to terms of order k, up to terms of order k. So this is a, uh, uh, most important technical proposition. So I do not go into the detail of the proof, but uh, I, I want to mention a very uh, important idea about how to prove it. So the idea to prove this kind of result is using the so-called uh, perturbation theory. So the, in particular, the degenerate perturbation theory. 
So in perturbation theory, uh, we have a matrix function, d by d, analytic matrix function. So every entry is a function of epsilon, which is analytic. For example, a typical one is like this. So here, x0 and x1 are fixed matrix, and this is a perturbation. So we consider this kind of thing. And in perturbation theory, uh, we assume, so this is important, we assume that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are also analytic functions of epsilon. So we have this kind of uh, identities. And then because eigenvalues and eigenvectors are analytic, so we can compare the terms of degree, any degree on both sides. So by, use, uh, by proceeding this way, we can obtain many identities by comparing the, uh, the terms of the same degree. So this is the idea of the perturbation theory. So, but here is the drawback. So in perturbation theory, we assume that the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are analytic functions, but of course, we have to be careful when this assumption is met when this assumption is satisfied. So actually Sabri and I uh, looked at many books and introductory papers about perturbation theory. But as far as I saw, we saw uh, none of them discussed when this assumption is met. So, but, but of course uh, the references we saw are limited. So if some of you know a good reference, then please let me know. So as far as we saw, none of the references discuss uh, when this assumption is met. But in fact, as, so, but, but there is uh, such a theorem. Uh, in, in this case, we use the so-called implicit function theorem. Yeah. So, but in particular, uh, in this case, we use the uh, complex holomorphic version of the implicit, uh, implicit function theorem. So the statement is that we have Q, uh, complex analytic functions. So, and we have two sets of variables, x and y, but the x are uh, p-dimensional variable and y is a q-dimensional variable. Uh, but, but of course, these are restricted to a certain domain on which these functions are analytic. And then uh, let us suppose that uh, at, at this specific point, uh, and this point is uh, zero for all of the functions, and another assumption is that uh, if we consider this Jacobian with respect to a second set of variables, y1, y2, dot, dot, y, q, and then if we take the value at this specific point, the assumption is that uh, this value of the Jacobian is non-zero. Then we can apply the implicit function theorem. The statement is that, uh, number one, there exists a neighborhood of this specific point, which we call u, and then we, uh, we have also Q analytic functions, G1, G2, the, the, the GQ, which are uh, functions of X, the first set of variables, such that on U, if we restrict ourselves to U, then this XY is a zero of all the functions, if and only if um, we have this one. So y1 is equal to g1x, y2 is equal to g2x, etc. yk is equal to gqx. Yeah. So this is the implicit function theorem. So uh, using this theorem uh, and somehow uh, after some manipulation, we were able to prove the pro proposition which I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay. Anyway, so uh, by the result of the proposition, now epsilon e is written in this way. And, but, but here, as you, as you see here, so this eta is given for each value of a. So this eta is dependent on the choice of a, okay? But now uh, we discuss our search algorithm. So, uh, I'm sorry, I have to hurry. So uh, our choice for the scalar eta is this one. So then as you see here, uh, this one and this one uh, are very similar. So, but from here, from now we set, uh, we consider two values of A. One is one, the other is negative one. So when A is one, this term vanishes. And when A is negative one, this term again vanishes. So for these two 
choices of A, namely plus one and negative one, uh, this one and this one agrees, agree with each other up to terms of degree K, okay? So, but uh, uh, this is a, a approximation we need. So this, this is a precision we need. Then uh, by the pr proposition, we have two uh, eigenvectors, one corresponding to one, the other corresponding to negative one. Then uh, by, by the proposition, so uh, when epsilon is zero, the, this entry is one, and this entry is negative one, okay? So now uh, we have four vectors. So this is the initial state. This is the target ve uh, vector. This is one of the eigenvectors, and this is the other eigenvector. Then as you, as you see here, we have this linear combination, approximate linear combination, and this approximate linear combination, okay? So, and these are the uh, linear combinations we need, as I mentioned in some of the previous slide. And also, uh, so there is a formula describing the eigenvalues. So for using these eigenvalues, we can also compute the running time. And the running time is given by this one, and this is uh, described in this way, maybe because epsilon is one of the square root of n, but the number of vertices capital N is equal to N choose K. So this is approximately uh, square root of N times pi over two. So this achieves a quadratic speed up, okay? So in this way, uh, we prove the, that the algorithm achieves a quadratic speed up. So here is an example. So when K is four and N is 200, the running time is like this. Uh, 12,825. So here, the uh, horizontal ax axis represents time, the, and the, this vertical one is success probability. And as you see here, at this time, the uh, success probability is almost one, okay? But another example, so this is uh, almost the same one. So uh, I do not have time, so, but anyway, so at first the Hamiltonian is given by this gamma, so but the gamma and eta are related in this way. So actually we can compute gamma in this way. And these are some values, but as you see here, it is very complicated. So I, I think there is no clean formula. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, will, uh, I, I will finish soon. So, but, but anyway, so this is a message to Paul Torelga. So, so this gamma, so describing gamma is the same thing as describing this sum. So maybe I, I want to know if Paul has ever considered this kind of sum. But anyway, this sum plays a very important role in quantum search. So this is some future work. So, but anyway, uh, there is a result about discrete time case for J and three. So an immediate project is to uh, consider this case. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, two, two minutes have, have passed. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe I cannot hear you. If there are questions, just post them in the chat. Like the best way. Oh, how does the uh, search time scale with K? So like, like this, so yeah. Okay, so we have this formula. Largest two eigenvalues. 
So uh, these two eigenvalues are very close to the degree of the Johnson graph, but uh, they, they, they are different, but they're very close. So they converge to uh, the degree K, uh, degree of the Johnson graph. So Paul does not recognize the formula, unfortunately. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, when you apply the perturbation theory, you have to be careful. So when the assumption is made, so in many references, the perturbation theory starts with assumption that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are analytic function. So, but we have to be careful when this assumption is made. So this is why we uh, invoke the implicit function theorem. So this is my uh, most important message in this talk. Oh, what other families of this as regular class? Oh, so uh, there are many other dis families of this as regular class. So uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, it may be an idea to try uh, other families of this as regular class, but I'm not sure if it is a good idea to write one paper for each family. <laughs> then of, of course you can write many papers, but hmm. So maybe it is better to try to establish a general theory rather than uh, focusing on each of the families. Oh, yeah, uh, what exactly is, so uh, 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 up to scalar multiple, uh, this one, is uh, basically equal to this one. Yeah. So uh, something like this. So here, epsilon is one over square root of n. So as you see here, these formulas are very messy. So I personally, I do not think that uh, this sum has a nice expression. Oh, and uh, do we know any negative examples where spatial search would not work? Ah, so this is also discussing uh, the paper by uh, Childs and Goldstone. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, they considered uh, Cartesian powers of cycles. So they called uh, lattice graphs. And when the dimension of the lattice graph is at least greater than four, then they achieve uh, the quadratic speed up. But if the dimension is less than four, then uh, the result fails. So this is a, uh, a counter example. So I, I don't understand how the quantum algorithm will move from the uniform distribution into the primary module. Into the primary module. So uniform distribution is the all ones vector, scalar multiple of the all ones vector. So obviously this is uh, E naught times bracket W. So this belongs to the primary module. So it seems to me it seems to me that the game is over once I get a measurement inside the primary module. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, for, for any choice of the marked vertex, the uniform superposition, namely it is a scalar multiple of the Euler's vector, this vector belongs to the primary module of the Torilga algebra for any choice any choice of the marked vertex. 
So uh, this is why we can choose this vector. The game is over. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I do not understand your question. Hmm. So, yeah, 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 you are right. So, at first, we, uh, we do not know which of the vertex uh, the marked vertex is, but nevertheless, uh, it is guaranteed that the old one's vector belongs to the primary module. So this is a trick. Oh, yeah, so, so uh, the question is, have you looked at multiple marked vertices? So this is written in the uh, future work. So today I talked about uh, one marked vertex, but it is a very interesting idea to consider more than one marked vertex. So this is a very important uh, question. And uh, it is a project very worth trying. Did I answer all the questions? I, I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah, Th thank you very much. The formula depends on unknown W. So uh, as you see, uh, all the formulas up to here are independent of the choice of the marked vertex. So for example, the definition of this as regularity is independent of the choice of W. And all the formulas are so far are independent of the choice of W. Even after yeah, perturbation, yeah, yeah, yes. So uh, this is basically because the Johnson graphs are vertex transitive. Yeah. So if uh, we have one formula for a vertex, then because of the vertex transitivity, we, uh, this formula is uh, transformed, translated to a formula for the another vertex. 